sorry, I was mute. Now you, you guys can probably hear me. Uh, I was saying this is our fifth lecture. Welcome back. Um, before getting started, just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, you may have noticed um, from my last email, I, I already reviewed and graded your, your submissions. I think everyone did pretty well, so congrats. Um, if you haven't, please take a look at the, uh, the feedback. I, I left as comments in your in your submission. So you go to the same place and I think I picked the first uh, file that is in your submission. So you can you can uh, check the, uh, the feedback. As I say, I think everyone did pretty well. Um, I, I think that typical thing I noticed is some of you were setting the working directory. Please don't do that because otherwise the scripts won't work for me. I usually run your script, I, I always do, so just to be sure that everything is working. Um, but yeah, I think everyone did pretty well, so, uh, but if in any case you have any questions, please do, uh, do let me know, okay? Um, what else? Uh, any questions about assignment two? Oh, how are you guys doing with that? Looks like we don't have any questions for assignment two. Okay, just a reminder, it's due next Monday at midnight. So we will have the office hours on Friday um, and, and the next lecture before the submission. Jim, uh, when you write the test function, do you want us to uh, still post true and false or is the default Okay, good question, Shin. I will. I will say I would like to test both cases. Um, I think someone else was actually asking about this by email. Yeah, I will. Uh, in general, what you want in your test functions is a, is a good question. Thank you for that. Um, in general, what you want in your test functions is that the functions basically test all possible scenarios uh, for 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 your function. So I would say. Try a few ones, try one with, uh, with the default value, try one with uh, the alternative being explicit and try one again with, with the default value being explicit. So in that way you cover more or less the, the three possible situations. Make sense? All right. Okay, uh, so if you guys don't have, no problem, if you guys don't have any questions, or any further questions, feel free as usual to to, uh, to comment on the chat. Let's get started with uh, with the lecture. Let me start by sharing my screen. Uh, all right. So we're going to be talking today about um, matrices. Um, hopefully, you will find this useful. Um, we're going to be talking about matrices. Arrays, which is a more general concept uh, related to matrices. And finally, data frames. We talked a little bit about data frames a few lectures ago, but we're going to, to come back to, to talk about uh, data frames again. You guys, I hope that you guys can see the slides and can see my video feed. Uh, soon it's behaving a little bit weird for me today. I, I, I dropped my connection earlier so hopefully it won't happen but just in, in case I just a heads up so um, let's see so for today as I mentioned we're going to be talking about arrays and matrices and then data frames because there are some interesting features about data frames that we haven't uh, discussed the first time that we we talk about them so this is kind of a continuation of uh, vectors and their features so if you remember vectors you guys are working with with vectors, uh, with vectorized forms and not vectorized forms for assignment two. But one of the nice things of the vectors is that are very efficient. And the reason, one of the reasons why they, they, they are efficient is because they are homogeneous. In the, it means that they are all of the same, all the elements in the vector are of the same type. They are also compact and they usually are, not they usually, they are not nested, meaning that you cannot have a vector inside a vector in, in, in contrast with a list where you can have nested lists as we saw in assignment one. So examples of vectors that we have seen before is uh, can, be, can, can be defined by the operator C in R, it can be numbers, it can be strings. You can get the type by doing a structure 
of the vector, or you can define with other operators like the colon, and then you get a range from 1 to 17 in the example. But you can see it's, it's just one type uh, for all the elements, characters in the case of the strings, or integers in the case of the numbers. So C is, is the function, as we have seen before, that can combine different, different elements into a vector or a list depending on the type. Um, different ways to create vectors. I think some of this may have seen, um, we may have seen or not. The sample function is a good one. So the sample, what it does is actually create a, a vector by specifying different samples that are taken randomly from a list of elements. So in this case, sample, the sample function goes and look at the range between one and 10. So those are the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, and then pick four of them randomly. So if you run this function, uh, you will get different numbers than, than the example I'm showing you here. And if you run the function again, you also will get different numbers. And this is because it's, it's randomly picking these numbers. Uh, now, there are a couple of arguments that you can, you can use for the sample function, in, the, in particular replace equal true, means that um, you can think about this as the typical statistical uh, exercise where you have a bag with numbers and then you pick four numbers. And the question is, okay, which is the, the probability of getting one of these numbers? And a very important feature there is, okay, do I put the number back into the bag where I pick it from or not? So replace equal true activates the, the action of putting back the number. So in this case, as you can see, I, I'm getting two numbers that are repeated, seven, uh, and that is because I'm allowing that from the samples I'm picking, they can go back into, into the, the space of samples where I can pick from. Uh, one, th this is a very useful function, and, and in particular, it's useful for, for generating random samples and in some techniques, some computational techniques, this is a very, very important feature. Um, we can also sample from a vector of true and falses, and because in this case, the universe of possibilities has only two options, true or false, this is a Boolean case, then we definitely need to use replace equal true if we want to have more than two options, because otherwise we will run out of options. So in this case, we are sampling four times between true and falses, and then we say replace equal true, so the true and falses can go back into the universe of, of possibilities for, for picking, okay? Sample function is super useful. We are going to be using it quite frequently depending on the, on the algorithms that we're going to use, but it's a very, very useful and powerful function. Okay. Any, any questions about this? I mentioned this because we are going to be using it in, in some cases, for instance, um, and it's at the core of other functions that we're going to be using as well. Okay. So let's talk about matrices. So one way to generalize vectors is into matrices. You can think about matrices as two-dimensional vectors, um, which are specified by rows and columns. And then um, the matrix function returns a one-dimensional vector by default, meaning that if you don't specify number of rows and number of columns, it will give you a vector. But you can, you can specify either the number of rows or number of columns or both. And then in that case, it's, it's going to be a two-dimensional vector or, or a matrix. So um, the, the function I'm using here, so the way it works is, okay, you call the function matrix, then you specify the samples, the numbers that are going to compose the matrix. And we're going to talk about this Arnold function in a second. And then how many rows or how many columns uh, you want for the matrix. In this case, I'm, I'm assigning this to capital A and then if I ask for the class of this object, is is a matrix. Now, when using the function R norm, this is one of the very important functions and, and where we start to see how, how R is, is, is very strong on the statistical side of things. R norm is a function that returns random numbers. Uh, random numbers are numbers that are, are randomly chosen from, from a universe of, of possible numbers. But in particular, they are chosen following a normal distribution. So if I tell you, okay, pick a number between one and 10, okay, if I don't tell you any, any particular property of the numbers, you may assume that they are uniformly distributed, meaning that each number has the same probability of being, of being chosen. Now, as you can see, this, this way of selecting randomly values depends on how they are distributed. 
And this, again, is one of the, of the important features of statistics. And in particular here, I'm chosen, I'm picking the normal distribution of the Gaussian distribution. Uh, it's a typical distribution in statistics. So what I'm doing is from with the R norm function, R stands for random samples. So I'm going to pick nine numbers taken from the normal distribution. And the normal distribution with some default values, centered at zero and with a standard deviation one. Uh, center at zero means that the mean value of the normal distribution is zero and, and the dispersion, the typical dispersion of the, of the Gaussian bell is, is of, of size unity. We're going to dive a little bit uh, deeper into these functions in, in a couple of lectures, but just to let you know what we are doing here, we are sampling nine numbers from the normal distribution. It can be positive, it can be negative because it's, it's, it's centered at zero. And then we are allocating them, we are placing them in a matrix of three by three. So it has nine numbers and three rows, meaning that there will be three columns. So to complete the nine entries in the matrix, okay? So and if we look at the matrix, then we have column one, column two, column three, row one, row two, and row three. And notice this notation, the comma after means, okay, this is column one, comma after two means column two, comma after three means uh, column three. If, if you say bracket one call a comma, then that's the first row, two comma, that's the second row, uh, three comma, that's the third row. Okay, very similar if you think about this as the data frames. All right. Now, um, is, is that clear? Any questions about this? So this is an example of how to create a random matrix of three by three, meaning nine elements on, in total, three columns, three rows, with elements populated from the normal distribution. All right. So let's see a few other examples. Um, let's see how we can perform operations with the matrices. So in this case, I'm creating two more matrices uh, with values from one to six with three rows. And because there are six values, it means now in this case, the matrix lowercase a will have two columns, right? Because we need six elements and then three rows. We have three rows, then two columns. Matrix B, we have elements one to six plus one. Remember what R will do with this. So it will add one to each of the elements in the range. This is called recycling. And then one plus one is two, and then goes up to six plus one, which is seven. So it goes two, three, four, five, six, seven. And now this is placed in uh, another matrix, which is again with three rows, and because there are six elements, two columns. Okay, so this is our matrix A, and this is our matrix B. Notice also how R positions the values, right? So this range goes one through six, and then it, it decides to do it in column wise. So one, two, three, and then four, five, six. That's how it fills the matrix. This is, by the way, called, um, or, or, or we say that R is what we call uh, a column wise um, language or a column major language. And that means that it performs operations per, per column instead of per row. So if we do now want to multiply these matrices, A times B, then uh, if we do A star B, what, what happens is the multiplication is element by element. So it takes the first element, element one, one, and multiply by the, by the element one, Y of the other matrix, element one, two, and so on and so on. And then you, you, you can check that A times B is the multiplication of each of the elements respectively. Similarly, if you do A minus B or A plus B, then you, you can see that the difference is this unit that we added to the second matrix. So you get minus one to each of the entries. Okay. So that is how the uh, matrices are manipulated in a, in a very straightforward uh, manner in R. All the operations, uh, at least the basic operations will, will uh, be applied element, element wise or element by element. Okay, we are going to see how to perform matrix, proper matrix and matrix vector multiplication in a second, but the usual operators will appear just in an element wise manner. Okay. Sorry, that's okay. So let's let's take a look what other, uh, to what other things we can we can do. And I'm going to keep using the examples of the matrices I just defined before. Okay, so one of the typical things you can do with matrices is a solve system which are described by the equation a x equal b, 
where x is a vector of unknowns, b is, is a vector of constants, and then a is the matrix that describes the system. This can be a, a dynamical system, it can be a system of equations, it doesn't really matter. At some point, usually in different fields, this equation has to be solved and you solve uh, for x. A typical way is you can multiply and this equation on the left, because matrix operations are not commutative, you can multiply by the inverse of A uh, on both sides. But it turns out, it turns out that in, in, in computational methods in particular, computing the inverse of a matrix is something that is usually a really bad thing to do. On the one hand, it's very expensive. On the other hand, depending on the numerical representation, it can lead to instabilities of the systems because when you compute the inverse, there are divisions involved. And, and now, so we usually recommend not to do that. Um, there are there are implementations. There are there are actually um, ways to avoid that. So the solve function is a function that is already implemented in R, and it solves basically the system a x equal b. So if I specify b in this case being the vector one to three, then I can do okay solve the system a x equal b, and then I get the solution for the vector x. Okay, now I told you we can also perform matrix vector multiplication or matrix matrix multiplication, but that doesn't operate, as you were saying before, it doesn't operate with the normal star. We need to specify a way to perform matrix vector operations, meaning that you take a column, for instance, you take this row and you multiply by each of the elements in the vector B, and then you add them together and that's the first result of A times B. The way to do that is to use this, this funny symbol, if you wish, which is the star sandwiched by, by two percent assign. So percent assign, the star percent, uh, percent assign is the matrix vector or matrix matrix multiplication operator. So when you do this operation, instead of doing element by element, you are doing the proper matrix vector or matrix matrix multiplication, okay? Now, one thing we can do is we, we can check that this vector X multiplied by the matrix A is, actual to, is actually equal to the element, to the vector B of, of constants in the, in the equation. Okay, any questions about this? Okay. So there are a bunch of special operators for dealing with matrices. So we just saw the matrix multiplication operator, which is, is all these operators are, are encapsulated by this, uh, this percentage time. Uh, the percentage O percentage operator is what we call the outer product. And that is basically when you multiply two vectors and you generate a tensor or a matrix. So in this case, um, A is a vector from one to three, B I'm defining as a vector from three to five. And then when I multiply this, what happens is I take each of the elements one to three and I multiply by the corresponding elements. So for instance, I take one, two, three and I multiply by three. So three, six, and nine. They, I take one, two, three, multiply by four. Then I get four, eight, and 12. And then by five, so I get five, 10, and 15. And with that, you generate a new matrix if you wish. So that's the outer operator. Uh, the matrix operator we saw, and in this case, because one uh, A and, and B are vectors of the same of, of commensurable dimensions, then you just get the inner product of this, which is the multiplication and addition. Uh, this one we saw already, but this just to convince you that what you get is the element wise uh, multiplication. Uh, this is the Kronecker product. So you, you basically multiply element by element, but you, you linearize. This one is an interesting one. It's it not necessarily applied to matrices, but it's a useful one. It's the modulus operator. So it basically gives you the reminder of the division of the number on the left over the number of the right. So nine divided by, by four gives you uh, uh, two, but there is a reminder of one. So that's, that's the reminder. Um, that's the actual division, of course. But then if you do percentage, division, percentage, it just gives you the integral part. So what we call the integral division of, of the result. And there is a bunch and there are many others and you can even define your own operators as you need. Just, just to, leave, to give you a, a quick view of how some operations had to be implemented using some kind of not straightforward symbols that you will find just by typing one character or something, okay? Um, 
more more about matrix operations there are a few interesting operations that we can use um now one thing that, that is interesting to bear in mind again think about matrices not just as as the typical ones that we see in the math courses uh, just with numbers but think about matrices as the generalization of vectors in r meaning that a vector is something of a type of a homogeneous type it can be numbers it can be strings or it can be booleans and so with that in mind we can say okay maybe we can take uh, a sample of booleans six booleans as, as we discussed before with replace and equal true and then if i look for what is the result that i get false true true false or something else probably you will get something different if you run this example but then i can ask okay the dimension of a is a function that usually tells you what is the size of the vector or the array or the matrix a in this case if i ask for the dimension of a it will give me oh this is a, a vector of six but one thing which is quite interesting in R, this is due to the natural or the, or the object-oriented programming approach that R, R has, is, okay, I can take this function, dimension of A, and assign something to that. And in this case, I'm going to assign a new vector, 3,2, which, because I'm assigning to the dimension of the object and not the object itself, means that I'm going to restructure this object. This object has six entries, but by doing three comma two, I'm going to restructure it as a column of, or, or as an object with two columns and three rows. And now if I ask for A, now it looks like a matrix, but a matrix of Boolean objects. And you can see there are two columns and three rows. I can change the order, what we usually refer in matrices as transpose the matrix and do two comma three, and now my, my A matrix looks like a, a rectangular matrix with three columns and two rows. And you can play with this. It's called reshaping sometimes. You can take the transpose, as I was saying, and then you go back to this two by three uh, matrix. Okay? Some, some things that, some nice things, some, some funny things that you can um, do with matrices and, and vector representations. All right? The data hasn't changed, the elements, which are Boolean in this case, it's, it's hard to follow where are the truths and falses, but you can try this with numbers as well. I wanted to show you that you can also have matrices of Booleans and of, of course of strings. Okay. Now uh, we talk about this because matrices are generalization of vectors, they are homogeneous. Okay, so you can try to change the type by doing a substitution, for instance, uh, if my matrix A was as before, and now I want to assign the element one, two, which represents column one, element two to a one, then the whole matrix is switched, okay? In this case, it's switched because of this conversion, this internal mapping that R has between true and false. Trues are represented as ones, falses are represented as zeros, okay? Remember that we can even do some, some fancy logic arithmetic with that. But look what happens if I want to convert the position 2, 3, which is a zero into a pants, which is a string. Now the whole matrix is converted into strings. The casting remains such that the value zero is represented as the string zero and the value one is represented as the, as the value one, as the string one. But now in, in position 2, 3, I have pants as a string. But the whole matrix is a string now, it's, it's our characters. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. So we talk about vectors, homogeneous types. We talk about matrices, a generalization of two-dimensional vectors, if you wish. We're going to take a, talk about arrays, which arrays are nothing else than the next step of generalization of these objects. So they can, in principle, have any rank. They are called rank or dimensions. So vectors are one dimensional objects, arrays are two, uh, sorry, matrices are two dimensional objects, arrays can have any dimensions. You can think about them as tensors, if you, if you have had uh, courses in, in general relativity or engineering to, to compute or, or fluid dynamics to compute the uh, stress en energy tensor of a material, for instance, you will know that in fluids or, or, or solid bodies, if you apply a stress or a force, then it's distributed in all possible directions. And then you, you do cuts 
you intersect with planes, and then you see the decomposition of the force in the different dimensions, and that can be seen as a tense, basically, how the force distributes in all these dimensions. So they are just, just a high dimensional version of matrices or vectors. How we define it in R? Well, very simple. There is the array uh, function. And the way it works is very similar to the matrix function or the vector function, as you, as you saw before. You get the values, and then you get the dimensions. So in this case, I'm creating an array of three dimensions. So it's like a matrix, and then a one extra dimension on that matrix. And it's, this case goes from 1 to 12. So my dimensions are 2 by 3 and then 2. So I have 2 by 3 is like if you were having a matrix of six elements. And then because there are two more uh, dimensions, the, twice that quantity, so it gives you 12 overall. If you look at it, if you ask what is the class, it tells you it's an array instead of a matrix because it has generalization of the matrix. And if you ask for the value of B, then this is what you get. This is the first element in the, in the third dimension of the matrix or, or the array. One, two, three, four, five, six. Remember, R puts the values by column. And then the second, the second slice of the third dimension of the, of the array is 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay? I can do something like that, but with a matrix kind of format, see, with same values, but instead of, of 2, 3, 2, having 2, 6, for instance, and you ask for the class and you see the difference because in this case, R knows that this is going to be a matrix layout. And so it gives you, you, give you a matrix instead of an array, okay? Not everyone will find itself using arrays in, in higher dimensions, but if you need to do it, then, then you know how to do it now and um, most of the tricks and operations that we saw before will will also apply to to multidimensional arrays okay any questions about this i don't know how many of you depending on your area of, of expertise or research some of you find these these matrices operations or matrices representations or high dimensional array representations more useful more useful or more interesting but this is very very uh, depending on on uh, you know on, on what kind of things you you do or you work with right so people doing um, quantum systems for instance they use a lot of matrix representations to represent it, the different states of the systems or people doing you know molecular dynamics or or solid state body physics uh, those kind of things or even general relativity although you won't probably be using um, r for doing analysis on that but anyway okay so let's go back to our old friends data frames um, data frames are one of the most important and relevant uh, data structures that you will find in R. And they are so important and so useful in data analysis that other languages uh, such as Python, for instance, which is another of the hardcore use in data analysis, which unfortunately don't have uh, data frames built in the language, need to have libraries that allow them to use data frames. An example of this is Pandas. Pandas is a pretty well-known library in, R, in Python, sorry, that basically made data structures behave very much the same as data frames in R. But data frames in R are, are super, super powerful and super, super useful. So we're going to come back to, to these data frames to just explore a few more features and review some of the ones that we saw at, very, uh, at the very beginning of the course. One way to think about data frames is to think of them as a list of vectors, very similar to what happened in a spreadsheet. In a spreadsheet, just consider one sheet of your spreadsheet, you have columns and you have rows, right? And usually, usually, the way that it works is you name your columns and you basically um, pull down the data there. You can also do by row, you can name your rows and then represent something with that data. So each column in a data frame, a column of the, of the frame basically has the same length, but different columns may have different types. So one can be dates, one can be uh, numbers, one can be strings, one can be booleans, one can be something else. So we took this example last time, I'm going to stick to this example, is, is the trees data frame. This is one of the built-in data frames in R. If you ask for the class of the, of the object trees, it will tell you, okay, this is a data frame. So it's one of the, the, of the um, native data types in R. If you ask for the structure, 
how is the data uh, laid down in, in this data frame, but it tells you a data frame has 31 observations, meaning that each column will have 31 data points. There are three variables, meaning that there are three columns indeed. The columns are called girls, hike, and volume. They are of time numeric. And then it just shows the, the, the first values of that column. Okay. I think we, we saw some of these things. One of the things that we, we may not have seen is how can we create our own data frames? Because I show you the example and how to manipulate some of the data frames that are already pre-built for us. But how can we create our own data frames? Well, there is the data frame functions, not so surprisingly, data.frame function that allow you to do that. So we are going to call the data.frame function. We are going to say, okay, we are going to have a column called pants and the values of pants go from one to three. So it will be one, two, three. And then the name of the person using, and imagine this is the size, all the number of pants that that person has. Uh, Larry has one pan, Susie has two, and Bob has three pants. okay? And I will assign this with some assigning operator to a variable, which I'm going to call my.df. And as simple as that, now we have created a data frame called my.df. If I ask for the names of, of my df, what this will give me is the name of the columns. And because this works very similarly to what we saw as name and list. And remember what I told you just a second ago, data frames can be seen as lists of vectors. So each of the elements, each of the named elements in the list are vectors. And <clears throat> if you ask for names, let me tell you, it tell, it tell you is pants a name, or you can also ask for column names because it's, it's the names of the column. You can also ask for row names and actually give row names to, to the data frame if you wish. And call names is the same as names. Row names by default is, is the index. So the entries, one, two, three, because I have only three entries. The number of rows also tell you how many rows you have. The number and call will tell you how many columns you have. There are a lot of auxiliary functions around data frames that help us to digest and manipulate the data very, very easily. Um, now, what happened? What happened if I want to add more data to my data frame? If I want to add, for instance, one more column to my data frame? Well, you may remember, you may see some similarities to what we saw some lectures ago um, about adding elements to the vectors or to, uh, to the list. So I can do, for instance, my dot df, that's the variable that represents my data frame, and then use this dollar sign notation and then a new name, for instance, socks. And I'm going to give the, uh, the color of the socks. So in this case, Arshad. Now, if I ask for the names of the data frame, it has been up, uh, updated to pants, which was before, name was before, and now socks. That's the new column, the new field in my data frame. If I ask for what is the content of my data frame, now it says the column pants, the column name as we define, but also socks. And notice what that has done. Because we only brought one value, now it recycled. Remember this behavior of R of recycling things as many times as we have entries? Well, it's doing that. It's recycling the value R child for all of this. If we wanted to say something different for the other entries, we could have say, okay, this is going to be a vector. So C, R child, and then comma Y, comma NA, if I don't have information for the third entry or whatever I want, okay? Another way, let me, let me show you this in a different way, is to create a second data frame and use a new function called rbind. rbind means bind a data frame by row. The R stands for row. So what we're going to take now is my data frame, which looks like this, the three columns and three rows. And I'm going to create, I'm going to add one more row to this data frame. So we saw how to add one column, how we are going to add a row with R bind. And now the, the, the fourth row is going to say, okay, punch the number, the names has to match the names of the columns of the my.df data frame. So punch is equal to six, the name is Shane, and the socks in this case are black. Now, if I ask how my df.2 looks like after using the rbind function, then, okay, I have my original data frame, which was up to here, the first, uh, first three, sorry about that, the first three rows, and then the fourth row is the number six, the name Shane, and the color for the socks black. So two different ways of adding um, 
data, including new data in my data frame. There is another way to also do, do uh, additions um, um, to the data frame. You can use a merge function, especially if you have two different data frames. Now that merge function is, is a smart, but something has to match. For instance, you want to merge by rows, uh, then the, the indexes has to match. If you, have to, if you want to match by columns, the name of the columns has to match. Um, similarly, there is a C bind, as there is a R bind function, there is a C bind function, which is bind by column. And that way you can add a column to, to the data frame as well. Okay, so a lot of operations that one can perform in terms of updating, manipulating, and editing the data and the structure of the data frame per se. Okay. Um, this is important thing. I show you. I show you how to access the information in the columns. Usually, the way it's laid down is to lay down things by columns on the data frame, similar as you will do in a, in a spreadsheet. And there are indeed different ways in which you can access the columns. So let's go back to our trees data frame. Okay. If I look at the structure again, we saw we have three columns: girth, height, and volume. There are two different ways, uh, or three different ways, let me, let me clarify that, in which you can access the same column in the data frame. First one is the one that we saw before, is the one that is almost immediately uh, um, guided by the structure information. The name of the data frame trees, followed by the dollar sign mark or symbol, and then the name of the column, okay? This one is very rapid. It's very uh, nice to use in the common in the in the terminal when you're doing things interactively because you can press tab, it can auto-complete the names for you and things like that. But it's probably not the most useful one, neither the more robust one in terms of coding and programming. Okay. Which is usually the best one, is this second one. And notice I'm accessing the same information, the values stored in the column girth of the data frame. I can use the bracket notation. Remember the bracket notation with the commas where the first entry represents which row I want to see and the second, which column I want to see. Well, this is one of the most robust ones. And I tell you why in a second, when you are going to be passing data frames into your functions, and this is something we're going to do in assignment three, then you need to specify which column you want to work with that data frame. If you try to do it in this way, it won't work because the name of the column has to be a string. That means that it should go between quotation marks. If you do it that way, then you cannot use the, the dollar sign notation when passing arguments into the functions. You need to do it using the bracket notation, okay? So by doing trees, bracket, comma, which means give me all the rows, and then the name of the column, it will give you all the values for that given column. Alternately, one can do trees, comma, and then the index of the column, okay? So in this case, uh, girls is column one, so this can arguably be the same thing. The only advantage of this one is if I decide at some point to move my first column to the last position of the data frame, then I'm not more uh, stick to the position one. So in that way, it's a little bit more generic. You could argue, okay, I may rename the column to instead of girls, capital C, girls, lowercase c, and then maybe the cardinal number indicating the position of the column is better. As I say, it's arguably one or the other, but the bracket notation is a little bit more robust and preferable in terms of coding than the dollar sign notation. Okay, is that clear? It's usually an important element when you are, when you are coding and developing functions for, for analyzing data, storing data frames, okay? The other thing that is interesting of the bracket notation, this won't be allowed by the dollar sign notation, is that you can combine, you can ask me, okay, give me two columns at the same time. And you do this by saying, okay, the data frame bracket comma, and then you can pass a vector with the name of the, of the columns, or you can pass a vector with the indices of the columns as well. So we could say, in this case, one, three, or girls and volume, and then it give you all the entries for girls and volume. And for instance, if I only want the first five entries, I could write here before the comma one column five, and then it will give me rows one to five. Make sense? Any questions about this? This is an example of what I was just telling you a second ago. 
using the dollar sign notation is not the best way to implement things in a function. And this is an example. This is a, 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 a script that contains two functions that receive some data frame. The first example is a, what we call not a good implementation. And I tell you why. It's using, as I was telling you, the dollar sign notation, but also is hard coding the value of, of the name some column. So some column represents here what is the column name of the column where I want to look at. The second script, the second function, that's the same analysis, right? So some other analysis is, is what you will do with the data. But in this case, what we are doing is we are slicing the data frame or just picking the first column or some column and then doing some analysis with that. The second way is, okay, it's receiving input data, it's the data frame, it's receiving the data frame, but instead of, of hard coding the value some column here, I'm passing the name of the column as a default argument, okay? And then this I can change because if I decide to use some column as the column where I want to analyze the data by, okay, I just use that, I don't specify. But if I decide to change, and let's pick the example of the trees, instead of analyzing the trees by girls, I decide to analyze by volume, I just change, I specify my second argument when I call this function and that's all what I had to do. The, 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 the difference is just this first line of how we slice the data in this variable A, because we take input data, dollar sign column, some column in this case, or input data bracket comma, some column that will contain the name of the column that is our target for the slicing the data, okay? They look very similar, but one is definitely more robust and, and better implemented in terms of coding, okay? And I will be looking for this in, in your implementations for, for the next assignment, okay? Any questions about this? Okay. <clears throat> I was using the term slicing just a second ago for selecting a, 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 a column or a row or a chunk of data in the data frame. And we saw this when we did our vectors lecture. Um, it's the same concept. I can grab information very quickly from the data frame just by imposing some conditions. Very similar to how we did and how you probably guys are doing for, for the assignment too. I can take again my trees, look at the column girls, and from the column girls just get the first three rows. So I'm slicing by column, so I'm selecting the column, but then only focusing on the first three rows of that particular column, okay? Alternately to just look by columns, I could look by rows. I can say from trees, get me the second row, all the columns, the second row. Or I can say from the second row, give me the second row and the girls column, or the volume column, or whatever column I want, okay? But the slicing, actually, we took it one, one step further. And with data frame, it's even more interesting because now I can say, you know what? From the trees data frame and the column height, focus only on the trees that have height greater than 80. And from those trees, give me just the girl. So all that is given by this instruction here that we can go through it and be setting a little bit uh, more detail the first thing within the bracket is giving us the condition to the data that we want to access. Trees, the height of the trees that is greater than 80, and from that give me the values of the girls of the trees that has height greater than 80. And that is what is happening here, okay? Maybe, maybe I, can, I can demonstrate that. Let me see if I can pull my, my terminal. So um, I, this is an a, a, a important feature of R or, and, the, and the actual data analysis capabilities of R. So I think that we may, we may spend a second just demonstrating this. This on my uh, the right and this on the left. Okay, so make this a little bit bigger. We have this trees data frame, okay? This is part of your, of your R built-in data set. And what I was saying in the example is, okay, from the trees, let's look at the height. Oops. And this is what I was talking before. If you notice, I just type dollar sign H and press the tab key and it auto-complete the name of the column for me. So that's very, very handy, 
This is the, la the, la the list of values. Again, the color high is the second one. If I look at the values, it's just a vector. And then I can say, give me the ones that are right in the right. What do you guys think is going to show when I do this? What is going to show me in the screen? If I ask trees that are some high greater than 80, what is the result that you guys expect to see? Any guesses will be okay. Are we going to get the numbers? Are we going to get a vector? Are we going to get the data frame? What do you guys think we're going to get? going to do it and then we can discuss what we get. What is that? Let me shrink this a little bit. These are booleans, right? These are true and falses. And these are telling me, these are telling me where the condition of having these values greater than 80 are true or not. And you should remember again, the vector class, this is exactly the same that we, we did it for the word slicing. So actually I can now go and say, okay, you know what, this condition, I'm going to slice this condition with um, the girth, for instance, of the tree and do bracket of that because I'm going to slice my column of girths in the tree data frame by this condition. And then I only get, you can check that, let's see which values of, of height is greater than 80. So for instance, uh, let's see the first one. This is 10.7 and the value of the girls is 10.7. And that's the first entry that we get here. We could do also do something more interesting. We can actually slice this saying, you know what, that give me, give me all, instead of giving just the, the girls, give me all the elements, sorry, and I need a comma here. Give me all the elements that has, um, that has a value greater than 80. And now you can see not only the girls, which I'm looking at, I'm also looking at the girls height and volume. So I get the whole data frame. Now I can convert this into um, my bracket bracket notation and just getting the same result without using the dollar sign as we saw before. Okay. But this is the actual powerful thing that data frames allow us to do in R. Do a lot of slicing do vectorized operations as we saw before, which are way more optimal than looping as you guys probably are, are discovering in the assignment, not only from the implementation point of view, but also from the performance and, 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 and speed point of view for the computer, okay? Again, this is a quite interesting thing uh, to play with, okay? So don't want to, to um, you can follow the examples on, on, on the slides, I just wanted to, to show you that uh, indeed it's, it's, it's quite interesting that you that you can actually do these things. It's, it's something that is quite powerful in terms of um, in terms of um, manipulating and analyzing the data. Okay. All right. There's one more example. You can not only do slicing by one condition, you can combine conditions. For instance, in this last example, I hope that you guys, uh, I was playing a little bit with the, with the yeah, um, with the screen, but I hope that you are seeing the slice again. So in this last example, I'm combining two conditions. I want the trees which has a volume greater than 40 and a girl smaller or equal 14. And from those, I want to see the whole data or grab the whole data. So you can do that kind of combination. You can combine now criteria and conditions and then subselect uh, part of the data holding certain conditions. And again, this is just done in one line. So it's super powerful, super, super useful to do. Okay. Any questions about this? And as I said, this is going to be something we are going to be and keep exploring a little bit more in assignment three, okay? Mm. We talk about this, how to update data. So let's say that we keep playing with the trees data frame. Now for, for um, this is a, a usually a good idea to, to have an original data set and you're going to update and play a little bit, create a copy of that. So I'm assigning the original trees data frame to a copy and then I can, okay, the first entry, let's say I find a type or want to change something, then I can, I can reassign the first row on the third column, meaning the first entry in the data set to a new value. 
as simple as that, and then the, the value will be updated. Alternately, I can I can change a whole column at once. So if I call girls, the values that are contained in the column girls from the data uh, data frame, then I can multiply girls by two and add one, just for no real good reason other than demonstrating that the values can be updated based on the previous value. And then reassign, this again is, is something that usually consumes a little bit more of memory, but it's good in terms of, of you know, manipulating the data more clearly <clears throat> and assign to the whole column the new value computed for, for the column. So in some cases, you might want to update the column. In some cases, you may want to append a new column, depending on what you actually are after in, in your, in your uh, process of analyzing the data. Um, I think we talk about this, I don't remember really, but this is a quick way to read data uh, and import it. This is important. When you use this rot, uh, sorry, read.csv function, which CSV is one of the typical uh, formats where people store data, is, is known as comma separated value. So it's tabulated data, or the structured data. Uh, the data is already coming to a data frame format. So you don't need to format as a data frame if you have the proper flags and identifications and options for the read CSV function. And you can even read data from the internet. It can be local files or can be files located in a different URL, in a different website. But basically you can, you can actually grab, grab the data directly into data frames. Okay, this is an example. You can play with it, you can convince yourself look at the names of the, of the data, look at how the data is structured. This is, I think, is a, a smaller data set from an original data set published in, in, in the UK from the uh, health minister about, I think, dentist appointment or dental data or something like that, okay? But any, any kind of CSV data is, is basically accessible with this type of functions. This is another important thing that happens, not only in data frames, it happens at the level of vectors in R, but as we saw, vectors are part, integral part of the data frames, is what we call uh, these factors, um, um, what's called factors and, and, and levels uh, matching in R. So what happened is as soon as R detects there is a lot of repetition in, in one of the columns in your data frames. Uh, so for instance, the ORCAD express data frame is, is a built-in data set in R. And you can look at that data set. Um, maybe, maybe we can pull the, uh, let's see if we can do this trick again of having over my terminal. So I can show you that. There we go. So, or, oops. The ORCAD express data frame um, is a data frame. Let's take a look at the structure of this data frame. It's a little bit larger. So it has 64 observations and it has four columns. And in particular, when you do the structure of the data frame, you can see that the first three columns are numbers, something similar that we observe in the, in the trees data frame. But the fourth column has a weird or, or interesting uh, name. It says factors with eight levels. So let's take a peek at that, that particular column. And what happened here is these are the 64 observations that you have. Um, these are letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, H, C, and A, B, C, D, e, up to F. And what you see here is they are repeated all over the place. So what R does when it finds a situation like this, in particular with strings, not so much with numbers unless you, you instruct it, but especially with strings, in this case are letters, is to say, oh, these are repeated. I don't need to store the whole thing as a sequence because it's more memory uh, demanding. So I can instead say, okay, because I know that you have repetitions of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, I'm going to store these key values and then put numbers, say, oh, in first position, he has a D, in second position, he has a E. Keep records of where these numbers are repeated. In, the, in this case, it's a little bit um, overkilling it because you, basically you, for each number, you, you spend the same amount of memory. But imagine that these are genetic coding sequences or something like that. 
instead of repeating those values over and over again, think about uh, postal codes, which are six digits, then you keep just the records of which this particular postal code is repeated, in particular when we are talking about thousands of entries. So it's a way more efficient way of storing data. Uh, so that is what we refer to, let me go back to the slides now, what we refer to um, levels and factors. Now, the thing to bear in mind with levels and factors is it's more efficient to store, but sometimes it can be tricky to manipulate it. So for instance, if we look at, as I told you, the structure of that particular column, say factor, we say levels, and these are the levels, A, B, C, D. Um, if you want to convert a particular sequence of values into factors, you use the factor function, and then it tells you these are factors. In some cases, depending on how you want to manipulate the data, are, can be very, very uh, pushy in converting things or treat things as factors, you need to undo this, okay? So you can imagine that these are numbers and these are cardinal numbers or integers. And then you have you want to operate as them, like adding or multiplying, then I won't allow you to do that if they are considered factors. So you need to basically unfactor them. So there are ways to, to process that. And we're going to probably in assignment three, I will put some, some, some uh, examples how to do that. But again, this is one of the nice features of R trying to optimize your memory footprint and, 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 and some operations by treating repeated data as entry in what we call a, a matching per dictionary key so that the memory consumption is less and the, and the operation, operations of searching and analyzing can be optimized as well, okay? Something that you should, should have heard if you are going to work with data frames that, okay? Finally, there is a one final thing I want to comment. This is not necessarily data frames, but this is as close as it could be, is uh, something tables. So R can allow you to create tables. And let's take a look at the example of the, of the column created by factors. So this orca express treatment, which represent the different treatments, you can actually, is uh, what we usually call um, uh, frequency analysis kind of thing. So it looks at all the entries. So there are eight entries, as we saw, eight factors, and then how, counts how many of them are in this, in, this, in this column. So you get eight treatments. So this is an equal distribute number of samples experiment, for instance. You can also create samples from vectors. So I had a vector with different letters, A, A, B, A, B, B, C, A, C. So identify the unique appearances on the, on the data, and then it counts how many of them are. That's basically what else. It's, it's a frequency analysis tool, okay? You can do with other examples. You can do multidimensional tables. So you can combine two vectors, A and B, for instance, which are different, different combinations. And then it will do the cross-checking for you based on the positions, for instance. So uh, sometimes shows once for maybe, uh, and, and, and then for the last two, no, a yes. And that's why you're seeing here one and one and one. Okay, so multidimensional um, tables doing this kind of pair frequency analysis uh, uh, idea. Okay, useful command to, to bear in mind as well when analyzing data and we are getting more, in, more into the part of analyzing data. All right, so quick summary from what we saw today. We, we saw high dimensional data structures in particular we saw arrays, uh, which are multidimensional, uh, and matrices as uh, generalizations of high dimensional vectors. We saw data frames, uh, and we saw some slicing techniques for dealing with, with these data frames. Okay. Any questions from, from today's uh, material or from the assignment if you, if you haven't had the chance to ask? Yes. Okay, so if there are no questions, then um, I'm going to see you, uh, at least the, the ones that are interested in the office hours on Friday. Again, if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to post things on the forum or, or email me at courses at signet.utoronto.ca. And if not, I will see you um, next Monday. All right. Okay, everyone, have a good uh, afternoon. <laughs>